strange raw pain it is to know that I will not see you grow into a young man, Joshua. If what I now feel is true, I know I will not be there with you to share your triumphs or to ease the inevitable disappointments that fake places in the paths of our lives. But though I have tried to fight it, time, my mortal enemy, has finally won. In my mind, I have never been far from here. My heart revolves around this place like the earth around the sun. This tower, with the touch of its deathly stones, conjures for me the single regret of my life. And like all parents, I pray to a merciful God that the suffering of my life will be enough to ensure that yours is full of the joy that I was too frightened to grasp. And if you ever doubt that you have the strength to be true to your heart, then you must come to this tower and read these words. Two on a Tower by Thomas Hardy Adapted for radio by John Sen Stop, Mr. Fellows. Can we stop? Do you see it? Over there, behind the wood. There stands a column. You mean the old folly at the edge of the estate? I cannot think why in the six years I have lived in Welland, but I have never seen it before. The locals know it as Rings Hill Spear. Sir Blunt's great-grandfather is said to have built it to his own design, in honour of his late wife. What I know of my husband and his family gives me sufficient reason to doubt that, Mr. Fellows. Can we go there? Oh, but look at that trap, Lady Constantine. The carriage will never make it through the mud. If we can't reach the tower, how then does the occupant? Occupant? That tower hasn't felt the whisper of a human breath for nigh on half a century. But that cannot be. Just now I caught a reflection from the roof. Oh, no, ma'am. You're mistaken. But I'm sure I'm not. This is a mystery as well as an adventure. Let us go there immediately. It'll end in misery, ma'am. Oh, come. Dear Joshua, I must begin at the beginning. But how misleading the simple trajectory of cause and effect... You will discover in time that despite our best attempts to control our destiny, to control cause and consequence, the twists and turns of our lives are left to that capricious character, chance. Look, the door is open now. Wait here. Oh, that was quick. Uh, set it over here. And let us hope it is not all crossed like yesterday. I could have had no idea what or who awaited me at the top of the tower. I discovered a young man with flowing hair, his eye glued to a long telescope. He was a man so very different from the man you have known as your father these past five years. Why are you hovering? You know it distracts me. What do you see? Oh. Anything of interest? Oh. Uh, oh. Uh, my most humble apologies. I, I thought you to be someone else. The young boy who brings my lunch. Ray, what is it that so gripped your attention? Ah, uh, <clears throat> there is a cyclone in the sun. I have never heard of such a thing. Its beauty is spellbinding. Would, would you, um, would you care to see it? Here, uh, please be seated. Um, place your eye to the eyepiece. Uh, here. It is the strangest thing I ever beheld. <laughs> Tis only witnessed every two or three years. And are we in danger? <laughs> well, not from anything the heavens have to offer. Uh, not yet, at uh, least. I had no idea that experiments of such importance were being performed in my column. <laughs> Your column? Then uh, you are Lady Constantine. <laughs> you say it as if you did not believe such a person existed. And um, do you spend much time here? Every night, when it is not cloudy, and often in the day. But to what purpose does this stargazing serve? I have dedicated my life to the study of the stars. 
I aim at nothing less than the dignity and office of the Astronomer Royal. You are an impressive young man. I have never seen any planet or any star through a telescope, though I have often been enchanted by the evening stars. Ah, if you are enchanted by the magic of the stars, then let me beg not to be the one who breaks the spell. <laughs> but I wish to be informed. You are refusing me? Simply cautioning you against it. Science has no time for romantic notions. If that is your advice, then I shall take it. I wish you luck in your quest. And you, uh, you do not object to my use of your tower? As I did not know it existed until today, it would be foolish of me to do so. Wouldn't you agree? agree? (sighs) Why did you do that, Mother? I thought you were playing outside. It's a perfect day for flying a kite. Will you come down? When I'm finished. I'm writing her letter. Why? For when you're older. Why not tell me now? Because there are some things that you can only understand with age. Are you sad because father has gone? Yes, I am. I am sad because your father has gone. Now, go down to the bottom of the tower. I'll wave at you. wrong, ma'am. What? No, Tabitha. Pray, continue. Now at last is there doth... I'm sorry, ma'am. My concentration's broke. How long is it since the blunt set out for Africa? Three, maybe four years. I was only so I when he left. The whole village came out to see him off, I remember. Five. It has been five years since Sir Blunt set out on his lion-hunting expedition, leaving me here to idle my time, waiting for his return. I'm sure that Sir Blunt had your interests at heart. (sighs) We both know that to be untrue. You may be too young to remember, but my husband was, not to mince matters, a somewhat jealous man. I have heard it said. I'm sure it's the talk of the village. I'm sure that anything that is said is done out of concern for your ladyship. Other people's misery is such singular entertainment. It's getting late. Does your lady Constantine want for anything else? Tell me, Tabitha. What do you know of Swithin St. Cleve? The young man seems to have occupied my tower in the far field towards Clevedon. Swithin? Well, his parents died many a year ago. Reverend St. Cleve married Grandma Martin's daughter. They were a scandal at the time, I've heard it said. He married a country girl? Yes. But Reverend St. Cleve refused to budge on the matter, even when his old family abandoned him on account of it. Swithin were sent to a grammar school, and now he drives Granny Martin to her wit's ends with talk above his station. This was delivered for you, ma'am. By whom? He didn't have a name, or wouldn't give it. And now he's gone. Fellows, would you escort Miss Lark to the edge of the estate? It is getting dark. There's no need. I insist, Tabitha. Oh, my. Is something the matter, my lady? No, no, it's nothing. I will see you in the morning. You should not have waited up for me. Oh, it is of no account, my child. It is the duty of a doting grandmother. (laughs) Will you not stay, do we? Nothing would give me greater pleasure, but the movement of the skies waits for no man. If that is so, a quarter of an hour isn't going to make the difference, especially given the clouds tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you forget, I've observed you since you were a boy. I can read the size of your work more than you think. <laughs> Rest, Granny. Master St. Cleve, I am surprised to see you. Is it not a perfect night for the studying of the night sky? Is that passing talk, Anna? Yes, Mrs. Martin. Sorry to call so late, but I was passing on my way from Welland Hall and saw your light on. Come in, come in. Don't stand on ceremony. Swithin, get a pass in a chair. Oh, please, 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 don't go to any trouble. I was only passing. You're not going anywhere till I've had you tea some of my special pudding. <laughs> if, if you insist. <laughs> <laughs> what news from Welland House? 
Well, as you know, I'm not one for idle gossip. Oh, no, no, of course you're not, and a shame on anyone that says it. Mm. And I shouldn't speak ill of Sir Blunt in his absence, but he did his wife no service at all by the jealous strictures he placed upon her. Swithin, are you coming or going? That door stands open like a gaping mouth at the moment, so close it either way. I've changed my mind. Putting it is. <laughs> Surely Sir Blunt must return soon. Time is cruelty itself on the fairer sex. You should see her, Mrs. Martin. Neither sick nor sorry, but dull and dreary. Oh. I hear she doesn't care to get up in the morning, and Miss Lark says that as she plays, Lady Constantine yawns and fidgets and moons her great black eyes to the sky. Poor soul. And only an hour passed. She called me to the house on some business, holding a letter in her hand the whole time. But then she failed to engage me on the matter. Mm -hmm. And I'm a busy man, Mrs. Martin. My time is precious. And, um, what was in the letter? Be gone, Swithin. You've got better things to be doing than sticking your nose into other people's affairs. In truth, I tell you that whatever words were contained in that letter have perplexed the lady oh. greatly. Mr. St. Cleave! Mr. St. Cleave! Lady Constantine. I have decided to ignore your warnings and have come to observe the night sky. I am too old to be victim to the romantic notions of the stars. If you so wish, it is my honour and my pleasure. Oh, uh, please, uh, take my seat as before. You see, I have already trained the telescope on Jupiter. Its beauty far outshines every other star tonight. And uh, if we point it here, we leave our solar system behind, leaving the sun, the primary and the secondary planets behind us. Uh, now take another look. What do you see? Uh, a star, I think. Though it is so small as to be almost invisible. Cast your eyes above you. How many stars can you see? It is a clear night. If I were to count them, there must be thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands. To the naked eye, there are only 3,000. Yet there are more stars in the galaxy than there are grains of sand on every beach on the planet Earth. I'm not sure that the study of astronomy is good for you. It makes you feel human insignificance too strongly. One day, armed with an equatorial, I will conquer those uncharted territories. An equatorial? The most powerful telescope known to man. It is my dream, the tool that will allow me to prize the answers from the steely grip of heavenly motion. I ought to tell you that I came here not on matters of the heavens, but on a matter closer to home. But <laughs> this subject has somewhat dwarfed my own. Um, I'm listening. No, I feel foolish. Let us leave it for another time. You have quite overwhelmed me. Please, let me escort you home. It's dark, and all the better for seeing the stars. Of course. You see above you the great bear, and it may interest you that the bright star over there low down in the south, is precisely over Sir Blunt's head in the middle of Africa. What a coincidence. <laughs> that is exactly the matter on which I came to speak to you. How did you know? Oh, I had no idea. Master St. Cleve, I, I don't know who I can trust. I have been most disturbed. A mysterious letter arrived at Welland a few days ago, alerting me to the fact that Sir Blunt is not in Africa, but is in fact in London. In London? Under very peculiar circumstances. As I wish discretion, I have only yourself and the parson to turn to. Ah, oh, um... You did know Sir Blunt? Oh, only by sight. Indeed. I have come to ask whether you may be willing to undertake the journey to London to ascertain the truth of this rumour. Oh, I, I wouldn't hesitate in doing so, my lady, but I... But... I, but, my Lady Constantine, I have my work. My great theory is based upon the regularity of variable stars and the irregularity of this week's observations. Enough! <sighs> enough! 
I am sorry for asking such a small favour of you. <laughs> Young men are so selfish. But it may ruin a whole year's labour if I leave now. You are angry with me. I will go. If you promise me to do something, if I school you in the correct methods, would you watch the star for me when I'm gone? Will it be difficult? <laughs> Not if sufficient care is taken. <laughs> you are the most ungallant youth I have ever met with. But I suppose I must set that down to science. When can you set out? As soon as you have undergone instruction on the method of my observation. But you must point the telescope towards this star here. Do you see it? The bright star? Yes. That is the pole star. Every clear night during this time of year... Even then, as he talked me through the elegant complexities of my task and departed for the city, his thoughts had not yet inclined to the romantic. And yet my heart was softening to this bold young man. There is nothing in this life so seductive as a gift easily possessed. And this young man had the most important gift of all. The gift of life. Bother, Mr. Fellows. The upper echelons of this library have long been a fascination to me, and it is a joy dispelling their mystique. Here! <laughs> Here's another! <laughs> the Secrets of the Night. Is it uh, fiction, ma'am? Swell and St. Cleve, ma'am. Oh, uh, Miss Lark. Tabitha, I wonder if you could play that sonata from last week. I did so enjoy it. But I did not think to bring the music. It is only a brief journey to fetch it. You think it possible? Of course. Please, do not delay. You have news? Tis not Sir Blunt, but someone who resembles him. You are sure? I spied the gentleman three times. The last as I went to purchase this object glass. On each occasion, I was reassured that though he had Sir Blunt's demeanour, he had nothing of his temperament. Oh. How can I reward you for your trouble? There is no need. Being trusted with such a task was a reward in itself. Now, I must go immediately. My work calls. This object glass I have acquired in London. Oh! oh, 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 oh no, the glass! Foot, I presume Tabitha has picked it up. It has smashed. Perhaps it is not broken. No, no, what calamity! Is it this? It's a calamity, is this? It is just a piece of glass. It surely replaces it. You don't understand. It was much more than that. It was the essential element in the construction of my telescope. It has cost me all the money I have ever earned and all the money left to me by my late father. How now will I complete my grand theory? Perhaps it can be fixed. It is ruined. Please forgive me. I am a fool for thinking that I was destined for anything greater than the son of a milkmaid. So then... My hope for you is that you will come to share his passion for something. His passion was so fixed on the stars that it was as if everything else failed to exist. His mission was to conquer affairs of the skies, not affairs of the heart. And sustaining his passion became my responsibility. It became my passion to ensure that what fed him was replenished to plenty, because that in turn was feeding me. Wait here. I will be but a few minutes, fellas. Do you need help with that, my lady? It looks to be heavy. I will manage. So then? Are you up there? <clears throat> so then? So then? There is something wonderful about watching you sleep, Joshua. I want to protect you when you sleep. As I watched his slumber, his ignorance of my presence only heightened his innocence. I stood there, studying his frozen form. And as I turned, I couldn't stop myself from planting a kiss on his soft lips. Fellas, 
We must return to Welland. Everything all right, ma'am? Perfectly indeed. Quickly now. Lady Constantine. Lady Constantine, I am lost for words. Please be careful, Swithin. That is where the begonias are planted. Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, I must know how the glass ended up on the table. Perhaps it was dropped from the clouds by a bird. <laughs> I feel you know all too well how it got there. You are too good to me, despite the embarrassing spectacle I made of myself. Well, I mean this most seriously. You have a purpose which I wish to help you accomplish. Ill luck should not play a part. You wish to achieve great things. It is only fair that I should assist you after the good service you did me. One day, when I acquire an equatorial, I will be able to make those discoveries suitable to my true purpose. And when I do, I shall do so in your name. Why so? Because you are somebody who has shown faith. And that is enough reason for anyone to carry on. And if I were to acquire an equatorial for you? <laughs> But the, the cost is more than two grand pianos. Really? No. It would be a great business, I see. It, it, it could, of course, be fixed to the roof of Rings Hill Column, but... And it... what would Sir Blunt think if he were to return home and discover these goings on? <sighs> yes, of course. <laughs> Your husband. It appears it is impossible for me to buy one. An impossibility that hurts me as much as anything ever has. But as I lack a hobby... I shall choose astronomy and buy one for myself. I shall fix the equatorial on my column. <laughs> Lady Constantine... And uh, Swithin St. Cleve shall be Lady Constantine's astronomer royal. And she... she... Shall be his queen. Precisely. I shall write to the opticians at once. I shall construct a cabin at the foot of the tower for casual visitors to my observatory... And a path between Wellen and Ringshill so that I may more easily visit and observe your work. If you say so, it shall be done. <laughs> <laughs> Tabitha, can you put these flowers? Tabitha, a vase. They say... Mr. Fellows, Al, whoever's dancing on the time, has that work to do? They say, Miss Lark... But it ain't the moon, the stars and the planets that my lady cares for, but instead the young astronomer <laughs> who draws them down from the sky to please her. Oh, Sir St. Cleve and my lady. Oh, no, there's nothing in that but tittle tattle. Why, she's twice his age and a married woman. Exactly. And what do you think Sir Blunt would say if he were to return all of a sudden? Well, then we'd see some fireworks. There's nothing in it. Save for the amusement of some idle gossips. I expected more of you than this. <gasps> What did it matter what they thought? But it is easy to feel that. Now five years and so much more have elapsed to make a mockery of my life. The shame of my situation haunted my sleep. I heard the mocking laughter of the villagers as my name dropped from their lips. I had left myself open to an accusation of unfaithfulness. I had to put a stop to their gossip. Careful, careful, Amos. That single piece is more valuable than your house. Oh, don't I know it, bastard. Well done, well done. Lady Constantine, did you not receive my messages? I did, but I have been detained by important matters. Can it be that you have lost interest in your new hobby already? Believe me, the new equatorial will provide so many ways to glimpse the world of the stars and the heavens that it will banish the very concept of boredom. When will this telescope be in working order? It is taking a considerable time. Uh, uh, within the month, my lady. I hope that its delay has not offended you. I am working every hour to ensure the telescope is working at the earliest opportunity. Make sure, Master St. Cleve, that you fix your instruments without damaging the column. After all, this is the tower erected to preserve a family memory. Please show the Constantines the respect they deserve. I, yes, my lady. But when the equatorial is ready, I would like you to be the first to see it. I'm afraid I have lost interest in astronomy. There are more important matters in the world, Master St. Cleve. Ah... Uh, 
Uh, yes, my lady. <laughs> Don't take it to heart, Mr. Swithin. That is the way with them types. Believe me. A good day to you. Parson Talkingham, I must say you gave an insightful sermon on Sunday. Oh, my thanks for you saying so. The teachings of Job often fall on ripe ears. There is talk of confirmations next year. It will be good for the parish, no doubt. And has the bishop spoken to you of when they may be? I haven't wanted to trouble his lordship, but I believe he has spring in mind. How wonderful. Lady Constantine... Good day to you, Mr. Torquingham. Good day to you, ma. Lady Constantine. Master St. Cleave, any requests with regards to Rings Hill Spare should be directed to Welland House in writing. I, I don't understand how I have offended you, my lady. I know not to what you refer. I know that I am often wrapped in my own thoughts and problems of the world can often pass me by, but I have racked my brains for a, a time or an action when I may have offended you, and I can think of none. I must keep this brief. The whole enterprise is yours. You rent the tower from me, you complete the cabin, you raise the equatorial. I will simply give you my permission. I will pay all the bills, but only through you. I cannot be seen to take any further interest in this. But why? I know your interest stretches beyond pure patronage. I watched your face as I traced for you the path of Orion. This is no mere flight of fancy. It cannot be. Can you doubt it? But I dare not do it openly. So, if it were to be arranged in private, may you be persuaded to see the fruits of your patronage? I cannot. Within the month, the equatorial will be erected. I swear that the view through that telescope will be a more solemn and more beautiful vision than you have ever seen. Would that you saw such beauty on earth as you do in the skies. My lady? A month to the day. I will be there. You promise? I promise. Now we must part. Oh, uh, I'm very sorry, my lady. I didn't know anyone would be praying at this hour. Pray continue. Your playing soothes me. It always has done. Forgive me my sins. Sins not of deed, but of thought. They are indeed thoughts and impulses which are inappropriate for the wife of an absent husband. Though not perhaps unnatural for one who feels his victim. My lord, give me the strength to overcome. I, I, I'm sorry to disturb you, Lady Constantine. Tis of no consequence, Parson. I... Do not think I have his ear at this moment. I have some serious intelligence to break to your ladyship. I must call at the house the first moment you can receive me. If it is that urgent, Parson, you must tell me now. In God's house? But then, perhaps, God's house is the perfect location for the delivery of such news. What news? What perplexes you? It is not what perplexes me, but what may perplex you. Parson talking, I, I insist. Stop your infuriating prevarication and tell me your news. Sir Blunt is dead. My heart. What will she do now? There's nothing she can do. Just the man. Good evening, Parson Talking. Excuse the intrusion. I was passing and wished to inquire as to the progress on the tower. <laughs> it is near finished. The dome which encases the equatorial is near completion. I, I fear I will need to purchase a new set of hinges as the ones we have are not strong enough to hold the whole. Ah, uh, more expense. I'm sure Lady Constantine may be regretting the moment she gave assent to such a grandiose scheme. Why? Uh, has something been said? You haven't heard? Sir Blunt Constantine is dead. In Africa. Mm. Buried in the ground somewhere in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> 
Lady Constantina sent the household into mourning. But worse than that, Granny Martin, the lady faces complete impoverishment. Oh. She was to visit the column to inspect her patronage. That's out of the question now, Swithin. The lady is in mourning. Is there anything else I can do for you, ma'am? Not at the moment, Tabitha. What news is there from Welland? I have counted almost 30 days since I left this suffocating place. There's little talk, but I've rings ill spear. It's finished. It is. Master Swithin sent word to fellows, and I believe he was to tell you in due course once your mourning was at an end. Oh, had I known, I would have sent congratulations. It seems a fitting epitaph to my late husband's quest for new horizons. Will that be all, ma'am? One more thing. I would like to visit the column, out of respect for my husband and his ancestors. I feel it is only proper to examine what work has been done to Rings Hill Spear. Yes, ma'am. Could you send word for Mr. St. Cleve to leave the door unlocked so I may ascend the column? There is no need for him to attend. Yes, Lady Constantine. I'll do it straight. <laughs> I did not expect you. I recognised your footsteps instantly. This cabin is a homely addition. But not extravagant, I hope. No, but let us ascend. Your first impression? It is quite changed. And this is the equatorial about which all this fuss was made? It is a wonder of modern science. The dome is well constructed. The workmen have excelled themselves. They have. But is this it? The only view is through this brief aperture. <laughs> no, my lady. <laughs> my goodness. The heavens are open to us. Has all this made you happy? It is all yours, <laughs> Lady Constantine. Everything you see belongs to you. That can soon be remedied. It shall all be yours. A present. <laughs> oh, I, I cannot accept. It is too much. No. You must accept it all. The cabin, the dome, the equatorial. <laughs> they are already reputed to be yours, and now they must be made yours. <laughs> oh. And if you ever go away from me, well, from this place, I mean, and marry and forget me, you must take these things and never tell your wife or anybody else how they came to be yours. You are too kind to me. <laughs> For what reason, I do not know. You speak of marriage. I may go away, but I will never marry. Why not? Science is enough wife for me. Combined with a, a little warm friendship with one of kindred pursuits. And who should that friend be? You, Lady Constantine. Scenery is well hung tonight. Yes. Uh, here, uh, take a look through this eyepiece. You see Jupiter and Saturn. They are vibrant in the sky, in spite of the looming storm clouds. But look at the distant constellations. And what you are looking at now has been seen only by a handful of men. This is the darkness the naked eye cannot penetrate. I feel so much in awe in the presence of this instrument that should I be alone, I... I would be fearful. Master St. Cleave! Are you in there? Master St. Cleave! I'm on an urgent errand for the doctor. Your grandmother is unwell. No, I cannot be found up here. It is only Tabitha, your maid, sir. All the more reason why not. I, I don't understand. Some of my servants mistakenly suspect my interest to be less in astronomy than in the astronomer, and they must have no showing for such a wild notion. But what trick of fate could have led them there? Indeed. I cannot think of anything more ridiculous. You with your life ahead of you, I, a widow of 38 years. Of course. It, it is ridiculous. Now, I must lock the cabin door. For sure, he's in. I can see a light on top of the tower. Perhaps they are together, taking in a romantic air. Oh, don't be starting with that again. Well, I'm only questioning as to why the lights are on in the cabin, and yet no one is answering. Oh, get gone, Archie fellows. That mouth will get you into trouble. Well, if you see my lady, 
You be telling her to get back to Welland. This weather's only going to get worse. Oh, how could I have been so blind? Oh, Swithin. A thousand telescopes could not have shown you what was staring you straight in the face. Tabitha, my apologies. I was making an important observation. Excuse me for interrupting you, sir. But your grandmother's caught in a chill. Tis nothing serious, Dr. Arden warrants. But he's demanded that she be attended to, and I have to be at Welland by the morning. Of course. And you, Mr. Fellows, uh, how may I help? Well, Lady Constantine has taken for a stroll. I've brought the trap for her. I, uh, I'm afraid she hasn't passed this way. Have you tried the Underwick Gardens on the other side of the house? She often speaks of them. I hadn't thought of it. And take Miss Lark on your way. It's not good for a girl to be caught in this kind of weather. Of course. Oh, did, the, uh, did the doctor say anything else? She's left all instructions on her bedside. Oh, thank you for your care, Tabitha. Lady Constantine! <laughs> Lady Constantine! Lady Constantine! Lady Constantine, I pray a moment. Swithin, I must return before I am missed. Fellows will arrive and note my absence. I cannot let you return without telling you that just this moment I have dared to think of you as I have never thought before. How is that? I think you know how that is. And even if I understand it, what purpose could it serve? As to purpose, I have none. These newborn feelings are too innocent to have discovered one. But had these feelings not been born, I would never have fully realized how gentle and sweet you are. Only think of my loss if I had lived and died without seeing more in you than astronomy. Astronomy once more. A far superior love in your life. And deservedly so. My dear Lady Constantine, when you talk... I shall love your understanding, and when you are silent, I shall love your presence. The stars are no greater than your silent beauty. Say no such things. I should despise myself if I felt that I had distracted you from your work. Your work is the most important aspect of your life. My dear lady, distraction feeds off uncertainty. So I pray it give me some proof or, or little sign that we are one in heart. And that this is not mere presumption on my own part. You may kiss me here. Does that suffice? Yes. Then let that be the end of this. You must return to the tower. The night has drawn rain with it and the dome lays open. Let the rain pour upon it and all my work. The only stars of my future are your eyes. You cannot say such things. To ruin your future as I fear I am doing would be a crime, the guilt of which I could not bear. Nothing can come of this. <sighs> Nothing. I feel more alive now than I have done in all my life. But you will come to despise me when you get older. But the story seems clear now. You will recite it differently with age. I will be recast as the elderly predator, swooping down on your unsuspecting youth. But, dear lady, I am twenty years of age. I am no longer a boy. But I am near twice that. Is that not fearfully old? Not fearfully old. But old nonetheless. We must forget this interlude. I must go. Lady Constantine, this is no mere interlude to me. If it is simply that to you, then I... I will go away from here. Love dies, and it is just as well to strangle it at birth. It can only die once. No! I, I did not mean that you should go away. Your prospects are even more hurt than mine if I stay. Sir Blunt is dead, and you are free to marry again, save for this fancy of ours. I'll leave Welland immediately. No. no. You must not do anything so rash. I have gone to great expense with the tower. That it would be churlish and ungrateful for you to leave now. My lady! Lady Constantine! It is my man's servant. We cannot be seen together. The risk is too great. Then we must not see each other again. Ever? Ever. Absolutely. We must put this behind us. It <laughs> lowers us both. <laughs> I cannot think of anything worse than chancing upon you again. I will do everything to avoid it. You promise? I promise. Lady Constantine! Good night.
this with an... I remember watching as he disappeared into the night. The white of his shirt filling the spaces between the leaves. Our pact to never see each other, the fuel of our secret passion. As summer passed away and autumn came creeping on, I would take the lander over the hill at Aubrey, just to glimpse him upon the tower, or see the equatorial shift on its axis. We would snatch glimpses of one another before church, or sometimes, as I passed through Welland, our eyes would meet, and my heart would stop as I fixed on the beauty of his youth. A letter for you, ma'am. Delivered by errand boy from Mr. St. Cleve. Oh? I fear the autumn wind may have destroyed some of the young master's work at Rings Hill Spear. Thank you, Mr. Fellows. <clears throat> so then, what troubles you, sir? Your letter has most alarmed me. I cannot bear it any longer. I cannot concentrate. I, I have ceased to study, ceased to observe. The affection I have for you absorbs my life and outweighs my intentions. <sighs> my work is now an impossibility. But your remedy? I fear the worst. You are going away from here and from me. My dear Lady Constantine, your imaginings could not be further from my mind. My remedy stems from the fear that fate may take you from me. I cannot work for my state of perpetual apprehension. I feel the same. Then for my remedy, Lady Constantine, allow me to marry you. I, I mean, of course, privately. Let it make no difference whatever to our outward lives, for I know that in my present position you could not possibly acknowledge me as a husband publicly. Would a solemn promise not suffice? <laughs> Do you not love me? <laughs> Would that I could perish here and now. Then at least our problem would be solved. How can you say such a thing? You are very wrong if you say I do not love you. I love you dearly. Then why not adopt the remedy I propose? But how could the marriage be private? I... I would go to Pumpminster or some such town at the earliest opportunity to gain a license. Then we could meet, be married and return separately. I repeat my question. Or should I instead exile myself to some place and study as best I can in some distant country? Those are the only two alternatives. I suppose they are. Yes. <laughs> yes, it shall be done. I will marry you. My angel. But you must grant me one request. If it is within my grasp, it is yours. That you must never tell a soul of our relationship without my full assent and that you will never come to Welland without first gaining my permission as to the suitability of the visit. I still fear the censure of prying eyes. I am well aware that public knowledge of our marriage would prove a humiliation to you and your position as a lady. I will never allow that to happen. But one day, the name of this poor lonely curate's son will be on the lips of everybody in the country. And then, Lady Constantine, you may be proud to be my wife. When shall you go to Pumpminster? Within two days. As soon as we have made sure that our plan is watertight. We must hammer the tarpaulin down! The wind will destroy the dome! The hammer! Get out the rocks! Is it safe to let go? Try! Please come quickly! It's Grandmother Martin's house. The wind have blowed the chimney and the pin and end with it. The house is naked to the wide world. Is Grandmother safe? Tis a mercy your grandma was not killed. Eli and James are settling the thatch now, but I'm not sure how long it'll last. Tell Granny Martin I will be with her presently. But Mr. Swithin, you need to come at once. Go! I will follow, but I have urgent business to complete. Swithin, 
I thought you had already departed for Pumminster. The wind has destroyed Grandmother Martin's house. Wait there. God has truly meddled with our plans tonight. The gable end lays open to the garden. The thatch destroyed. It has been protected for the night by rick cloths. But I can't leave. This is fate, Swithin. Precious Viviette, do not speak like this. Our fate is in our hands. We cannot be beaten like this. I will depart a few days hence. Tis no matter. It is worse than that. This evening I received a letter from my brother Louis with details of his impending arrival. If we delay and I am absent when he arrives, it would raise too many questions. Your brother? What is the purpose of his visit? It is unimportant, save the fact that he will be here in Welland. Our well-considered plan cannot be overthrown by mere accident. It must be carried out as we originally intended. And you must go and stay in the parish for the requisite time. I'm sure I cannot. You can. And when my grandmother is again well housed, I can come to you. But does it not seem that I am forcing your hand by taking the initiative? What does seem matter? We in our hearts know the truth. Promise me. You will never say I showed a modest readiness in doing so. I will never reproach you or love you any less than I do at this moment. He believed it, and so did I. I looked at his eyes, Joshua, those eyes so like your own, burning and inquisitive, so sure of what they truly cannot know. And so it was that two weeks later, having achieved all the requisite formalities, I waited for my love to arrive. He had no idea of the contents of my brother's letter, informing me of his intention to marry me off to a genial squire. But then I had no idea of the visit that Swithin had received, as he was planning to leave Welland that very morning. Grandmother! Yes? Is your grandmother in, Mr. Sinclair? Uh, I'm afraid she appears to have left, and I'm in a particular hurry, so if I could ask you to return... Good, I... because I wanted to speak to you alone. As I said... You'll want to hear what I have to say, I'm sure. I come on behalf of your great-uncle. Great-uncle? Dr. Jocelyn Sinclair. Jocelyn? I remember Father talking of him, but I presumed he had died. Indeed. The doctor passed away, but only very recently... During his final months, he became very interested in your work. <laughs> but how did my great-uncle know anything of my work? He dispatched me, and I observe you, the construction of the observatory, and your subsequent attempts at publication. Dr. St. Cleve was very impressed both by your dedication and your apparent talent, <laughs> and has declared in his will that you be paid the sum of £400 a year for life. <sighs> In order that you may answer your scientific calling. Four hundred pounds. I, I do not deserve such generosity. It is a, a princely sum. It is. It was his wish that with this money you could succeed in your dreams, and he worried that you had inadequate support to facilitate your becoming a man of science. Dr. St. Cleve imagined the study of the sudden constellations would be of paramount importance to any astronomer beginning out today. A man blessed with great insight. The constellations of the Cape are something I have craved to observe. But his insight, or indeed my observations, have led to one stipulation. Your relations with that woman are to end. I, uh, I'm sure I don't know of what you speak. And I'm sure you do. I've heard talk in this town, talk which many dispelled as idle gossip, but which on stealthy investigation I discovered was far from fantasy, but instead it was the plain truth. I am offended, sir, both by the manner of your speech and the content of it. Lady Constantine is a woman of the highest moral probity and does not deserve the slander which you have brought to her name. Very well. Play your games if you wish. If you will make a fool of yourself in this way, which is, as I understand it, the very thing your father did, then it cannot be helped. It doesn't serve you well to speak ill of a man you never met. I'll leave you to your own counsel. The particulars of the offer are contained in this letter. The annuity will begin on your 21st birthday and will continue, providing you do not marry until after your 25th. 
If you do, the annuity will be ceased with immediate effect. Please, take this letter with you. The contents are only to offend. I'll leave it here. Your impetuousness betrays your youth, Master Swithin. I hope it will not endanger your future. I look forward to hearing from you. If I do not, may I wish you the best for your future life. Swithin! Swithin! What's wrong? You're pale. It, um, it is nothing. The journey seems to have quite exhausted me. I have everything prepared. The burns have been read. Let us hail a fly. My goodness, you look so dreadfully young. Can't you appear to look slightly haggard? The parson may ask us awkward oh, questions. Not again. Please, let us not talk of my age. It makes me uncomfortable. Oh, my dear Viviette, do not take offence. When I look at you, I see nothing but beauty and goodness. The slight difference in age is nothing but a, a cosmetic detail. If I have one hope, it is that you always feel that way. You are wearing a black tie. Yes. I bought it on my way here. Could you not have chosen a less somber colour? My great uncle is dead. You had a great uncle? You must tell me all about him, dear Swithin. But I see the church up ahead, and the parson, despite my fears, appears to be on time. Of course. <laughs> Let us concentrate on happier matters. Swithin, are you sure? After all that's happened, if you are in any doubt whatsoever, you should say so now. There is nothing I would not sacrifice for this moment. You talk of sacrifice. I do not understand. Silence, my love. Let us be married. Westbridge. Westbridge. <laughs> What kind of husband would I be had I left my new bride at Pumpminster Station like a dusty portmanteau? That was our agreement. We had a plan for good reason. If you understood life as you understood the stars, then perhaps you would not risk so much. Do you forgive me for it? Or have I already offended my wife with my devotion? How can I not forgive such beauty? Even to look on you is to forgive you. But you must promise I will travel on from here alone. I will catch the next train back two stops and continue from there. After, I make sure that you are safely on your way. Let me find you a carriage. Oh! My love, what is it? The end of the whip has caught my cheek. It bleeds. Is the lady all right? I must go to the waiting room. I apologise, sir. I do hope your wife... I do hope the lady was not seriously cut. I trust not. Where did the lash catch her? Straight down her cheek. If you'll excuse me, I'll go and check. Well, allow me, sir. I wish humbly to apologise. No, sir. I'll inquire. Viviette. Shh! Do not speak my name out loud. The gentleman outside wishes to apologise. He's no simple gentleman. He's my brother, Louis. He must be catching the train to Wellham. We must wait till he's gone. Your brother? Does this mark show? Then I cannot return. As soon as he sees me, he will know that I was the woman with you. <sighs> then we must go our separate ways to Welland, but then meet there and walk in the dark to the column. And I'll keep you captive there till the scar has disappeared. Excuse me, sir. <sighs> but I must be on my way. Please offer the lady my apologies. Sir, I'm afraid she is slightly shocked, but thanks you for your concern. She wishes you well. So be it. I'm late to Warburn and cannot delay you further. Warburn? Yes, sir. May I wish you a good night to you both. You are certain? He made no mention of Welland. Well, if he is to stay with friends in Warburn, then fate may have dealt us a winning hand. There is every chance your cheek will have recovered by the time he arrives at Welland. Exactly. Then, of course, you could have returned to Welland. This cabin is no palace. But it is a refuge, and you are here. My husband. <laughs> and still, I find the concept odd when I hear it spoke. <laughs> it seems unreal. <laughs> a dream. But, Swithin, you, you do have something to eat. Uh, oh, I hadn't thought. <laughs> um, 
There is a loaf in the cupboard. Oh! But wait. <laughs> Look what I do have. <laughs> Sparrows. Four. And one thrush. But I've never... I wouldn't know how to... Then it is time that you learnt. <laughs> Can you imagine my happiness, Joshua? I ask myself whether you have ever seen me as happy as when I and Swithin St. Cleeve roasted the birds, toasted stale bread, and supped cups of water from the pitcher. We slept that night under the eternity of the stars, and we swore that our little lives and the enormity of our love would last as long as the stars themselves. How wrong we were. In Two on a Tower, Lady Viviette Constantine was played by Maggie O'Neill and Swithin St. Cleeve by Blake Ritson. Tabitha was played by Amy Humphreys and Louis by Richard Heap. Fellows and Amos were played by Stephen Tomlin and Parson Talkingham and Bateman were played by Conrad Nelson. Granny Martin was played by Pauline Jefferson and Joshua by Carter Dowland. Two on a Tower by Thomas Hardy was adapted by John Senn and produced in Manchester by Stephen Escreet. Each of us has a moment, my son. The moment that we return to is the time of our lives. You are before yours, but it will find you. And before you know it, it will have disappeared like sand through your hands. Those two weeks following our secret wedding were the sweetest and happiest of our lives. Before the complications of the real world crashed down upon us. <laughs> Two on a Tower by Thomas Hardy, adapted for radio by John Sen. I never realized the house was so big. And yet there is something so sad about the house, don't you think? Especially in this East Wing, which has not seen life nor soul since before Sir Blunt and I were married. When I was a boy, there was a party here every weekend. The entire house was thrown open to gaiety. It will never be so again, unless you earn your fortune. The estate is saddled with debt, and I have nothing but a little private income on which to survive. And you are bound to occupy this house? Or lose everything. It was stipulated in the will. And in the event of your remarriage? The will did not say. Oh, well, I'm glad that you're losing nothing by marrying me. And I hope you lose nothing either. Or at least anything of consequence. What have I to lose? Your liberty. When you achieve success as a great physicist in polite society, and better offers come from bright young women, will you not regret this? Will you not despise me, your old wife? Does that answer your question? <laughs> Mr. Fellows will be fast to sleep, just the other side of the chapel wall. An empty chapel never fails to awe. Built by the same ancestor of Sir Blunt's who built your column. My column? It is yours now. <laughs> Everything you see is as much yours <laughs> as it is mine. What irony. An agnostic such as I owning a chapel. Uh, <laughs> don't say such things, even in jest. It's true. Science is my god. I have never even been confirmed. But why? Well, I, I hardly know. The confusion resulting from the death of my father caused it to be forgotten, I suppose. Dear Swithin, will you do this to please me? Be confirmed when the bishop next visits Welland. Word has it that there may be confirmations next month. Since I have done without the virtue of it for so long, might I not do without it altogether? No. Why do you not care about such serious matters without the church to cling to? What do we have? Each other. But isn't there 
in this an indication of a certain levity with which we have approached the sacrament of marriage. I am certain that neither of us has approached this marriage with the slightest degree of levity. And the bishop is a good man. I knew him as a parish priest when I was a girl. If it pleases you, dearest, I will be confirmed. Who could that be at this hour? Your brother. But he was not due to leave Budmouth till next week. If you are found, we are ruined. I will go now before the chance is gone. When shall I see you again? I will give you a sign. Now go! You should have given me greater warning of your arrival. I sent my letter weeks ago. Did you not receive it? Of course. But it is after ten in the evening. I have come to fix your situation. I require no help. I am perfectly happy. Oh, don't be ridiculous. Look at yourself. Rattling around in this huge place with barely two farthings to rub together. Have you no shame? I am content to live as I am. But I am not content to allow you to do so. If only you hadn't spent so much money before Sir Blunt's death. I received word in Budmouth that you renovated a tower on your estate at huge expense. It is an observatory for the study of the stars and the planets. What folly. There's a reason why women aren't giving the purse strings to their own finances, and there is straight proof. And you ride to town in your observatory? No. You have to let your manservant go. Is your hobby worth that? I am happy to be involved in the advancement of science. And uh, who is this astronomer? A young man from the village by the name of Swithin St. Cleeve. He is reputed to be hugely talented and has designs on becoming Astronomer Royal. Does he know? The arrogance of youth never fails to astound me. Oh, it matters not. You're reasonably good-looking, if not as young as you once were. I've set about finding you some genial squire with whom you can retrieve your position. I do not want to talk about it any further. Sir Blunt is not long dead. It will be regarded as unseemly in polite society to be casting about for a new husband. Rubbish! It's common knowledge that Sir Blunt was a spendthrift and a brute. Nobody will think twice about your remarrying. But also go some way to re-establishing a position for us both. Have you not even considered it? I will concede that remarriage may have been on my mind lately. But it is something I would rather not pursue any further. Look at your threadbare state, Viviette. You may have no option. I cannot bear being apart from you for such long intervals. It will not be long now. My brother is already growing impatient about the pace of life in Welland. How have you survived without me to write down notes? <laughs> I've been obliged to survive without you. See the columns. Object, right ascension, declination, features, remarks. But your appetite for work has returned. It is a small comfort when I cannot spend my time freely with my wife. But without your work, your discoveries will not be made, and we will never be able to be together. Our future together relies on your success. I grow ever closer to my discovery. The Equatorial has been instrumental in discovering a new constellation a small distance from Ursa Minor. Your work will not conflict with a confirmation. You have promised me. <laughs> and a promise is a promise. Do not worry. The preparations for the bishop's arrival have made me rather anxious. The bishop is coming to Welland House? For dinner, after the confirmation. I've thrown the house into a frenzy of cleaning and preparation. My brother Louis sees to it, and what is more, he's bearing the expense. The invitation was his idea. I would not have thought of it. Your brother insisted. Well, I will remain aloof till this whole business is over. I know it is hard, but I think it advisable. I will be able to watch my own philosopher from the corner of my pew. <laughs> Someone remarked earlier today that it is over 20 years since the bishop has sat in this humble and remote house of the diocese. But then I, Bishop Cuthbert Helmsdale, 
am no usual occupant of the Episcopal throne. Pompous fool. Naturally, a confirmation is one of the happiest and most prestigious occasions which a parish can hope to host. A magnificent celebration where we welcome fresh blood Tabitha. to the church of our Lord Jesus oh, no. Christ. T Tabitha, and allow Tabitha, your bag. Opportunity Tabitha, to your bag is about to... Th To the Don't worry yourself, Dad. Of which we stand. Oh, I'm such a fool. <laughs> In these challenging times. Worry change, not. He's only a bishop. <laughs> <laughs> to take the fight to those <laughs> who wish to cast aspersions on the very grounds upon which our faith is based. Congratulations, Master Sophie. Thank you, Lady Constantine. I, uh, I had no idea you were attending. A visit by the right reverend is a special occasion. <laughs> um, may I introduce my brother, Louis Glenville? Louis, this is the young scientist who has established an observatory at Rooms Hill. An honour, sir. Your yeah. face is familiar, young Swithin. You sure we've not met? I am certain of it. No, can't place you. No matter. It'll come to me. I never forget a face. But the bishop will be hungry. It's time we return to Wellens. Of course. All is arranged. <coughs> bishop Helmsley, what a wonderful service. Wasn't it just? It's a pleasure to do God's work when money's given such a gracious <laughs> welcome. <laughs> oh, oh, welcome's not over yet. Dinner awaits at Wellens. Oh. Perhaps you'd be so kind as to escort my sister to the house. It would be my pleasure. Goodbye, Mrs. Cleave, and... Uh, Good luck with your studies. As you can see, on a good day, the view stretches across to the Dothmore Valley. Oh, fool. Then you leapt up and said, if that is so, then why are they all round? <laughs> 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 you were always a precocious young girl, Lady Constantine, and yet look at you now, a grown woman. I fear I wear age badly, Bishop Helmsley. Oh, what oh. nonsense, Lady Constantine. Well said, Parson, talking of <laughs> More wine, Bishop oh, Helmsley. Why not? I don't have to sit back tonight. Of course not. not. There's room ready for you here at Wellens. Oh, you're too kind. <laughs> that was a singularly engaging youth who came up amongst Mr. Talkingham's candidates. Which one? The, um, youth with the corn-coloured hair. <laughs> Do you know who he is? He is the son of an unfortunate gentleman who was formerly curate here, a Reverend St. Cleave. Well, St. Cleave, you say? Hmm. His father must have been St. Cleave of all angels, whom I knew. Yeah, there, 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 there is a certain genius in the young man, I often think. Oh, really? He is a scientific young man, my lord. Well, he claims to be an astronomer. Oh, marvellous. Yeah, he claims it, Bishop. There's no evidence that he has any talent in that area. He's published no results. I believe he has sent some work off to the Royal Society or Greenwich or somewhere and has been published in some periodicals. Is that not so, Mr. Talking? I, I believe so, yes. No. And uh, where does he study the stars? He has constructed a beautiful observatory, having made use of a derelict column on the edge of the estate. I would have had no idea. Based on his boyish looks, that he would have advanced so far. I fancy he's interested less in astronomy, but in matters much closer to home. I'm not sure what you can mean. Your maid... The one who plays the organ. Did you not see their flirtation during the bishop's sermon? She... Tabitha Locke is only a village girl. Mark my words. She may be a country girl, but there's something there, believe me. <coughs> I, 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 for one, have never noticed anything of the sort. A youth with those Grecian looks may be exposed to many temptations. <laughs> it would be a shame if he followed his father's footsteps and ended in a match that became a hindrance to his advancement. Yes. I fear I must retire. It has been a long day, and I must take some rest, otherwise this headache will take. Oh, dear lady, I hope our conversation has not offended you. <sighs> not at all. I hoped you might stay longer. Let us all meet uh, for breakfast, if that's suitable for you, Bishop. After all, you have a long journey tomorrow. <laughs> It would be my pleasure. Good night. Mrs. Talkingham? And Lady Constantine. Oh, my 
dear Viv, what a wonderful surprise. But, but what is wrong? I've heard something so to your discredit that it appalls me. Please tell me it can't be true. I won't believe it. Whatever it is, I have a suspicion that you already do no, believe it. I won't believe that you would flirt with a village girl. Uh, not after all our vows. <laughs> now, now you laugh at me. Have I become a simple object of ridicule? Of course you have not. This is... Surely a simple misunderstanding. But my brother, who has not an iota of interest in besmirching your name, said that he saw you today flirting in the church with my maid. Ah, now I know exactly what this is about. <laughs> How good of you not to have fested on this for weeks like many a woman would have done. Is, is it really nothing? Less than nothing. Oh... When shall I be able to claim you and put an end to painful accidents such as these? Who could that be? Does no one of consequence? Probably somebody from my grandmother to know whether I am to return home. He's certainly in because I perceive a light inside. Is it possible to force the door? I think it would be a shame for the bishop to travel this far for no reason. Well, I, 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 I'm sure it won't come to that. You must hide here. Cupboard. I cannot. It is too small. What choice do we have? You must not allow them to find me. Or we'll be lost. I will try my best. Ah, Master Simply. My apologies. I was wrapped up in my work and I, I, I didn't hear you arrive. His lordship has been good enough to express an interest in your studies. Oh, oh. I am honoured. Where is the observatory? Uh, just through that door. I will show you up at once. And here are your books. Yes, your lordship. And how does it work, the, the large telescope mm. on the top of the roof? The equatorial. Mm. Allow me to show you. Mm. Uh, what's in here? Uh, and the, uh, the equatorial is this way. Oh. Uh, your lordship? Is there anything wrong? Let us proceed. This way. Viviette. They are gone. Without even the faintest hint of suspicion. I... I feared they would stay to observe. I tried my utmost to expedite their visit. But, my dear Viviette, the bishop has demanded to speak to me. You don't imagine he suspected? My dear Viviette, not in the slightest. On the contrary, I suspect that the bishop saw some of my father's spirit in me. Well, he did speak of your father, but he was to leave first thing tomorrow. No longer. He has decided to stay till noon. Perhaps then he wishes to offer me some financial assistance for my studies. Oh, swear then. How wonderful that the bishop has perceived the potential for greatness that I know to be within you. Dear Viviette, I am humbled by your faith in me. Our life together depends on our faith in each other. Ah, there you are, St. Cleve. Uh, uh, yes, Your Lordship. I am honoured by your request for a meeting... I, I do hope you enjoyed the tour of the observatory last night. Let me come straight to the point. If I had known yesterday morning what I knew twelve hours later, then I would not have confirmed you, Master St. Cleve. Uh, uh, I cannot begin to imagine what, what you consider me to have done. I had young men present themselves to me who turned out to be notoriously unfit, but I have never been victim to such Cool culpability as this. And may I ask what it is that has led you to this conclusion? This, sir, was found by me in your cabin last night. What is it? Why don't you see? This is a bracelet. A woman's coral bracelet. More than that, I know the woman was hidden in your cabin because I myself saw the cupboard door move slightly. Nobody was in my room, my lord, who did not have a perfect right to be that there. That is a matter of assertion, sir. My lord, I am in a difficult position. How difficult, nobody but myself can tell. But I cannot explain. There are insuperable reasons against it. But, but will you take my word of assurance that I am not so bad as I seem? Sir... 
You insult me further. I wish to hear no more. Pick that trinket up and return it to whom it belongs. One day I will prove that I am not the man you think I am. No more. One day I will prove it. Huh. Well, I never. So cleave. I would never have thought you had it in you. Truly, you are your father's son. Mm. Well, you've done well. I do wish you could have been a little warmer. Done well? You speak as if I'd been sitting in examination. Indeed you have. The bishop's examination, and he seems to have taken rather a shine to you. The question is how to capitalise on our advantage. Are you saying that the bishop has feelings for me beyond that of friendship? Come now. Don't play games. You know as well as I do that the bishop has developed an affection for you. If I'd have known that had been your plan, I would never have entertained it. It is lucky you have me to correct your short-sightedness. Have you not noticed, Viviette? You're getting old. Your black hair will soon turn grey. Soon young marriageable men won't look at you. What? You heard... Now, the bishop is 15 years your senior, and as such, it is a perfect match. I do not love the bishop. You married at 22 for convenience, and now at 38 you talk of marrying for love. I think you've got things the wrong way round. I will eat in my room. This conversation has spoiled my appetite. Spoiled your appetite? Agree. You have only one option, and that is to charm the bishop. Agree. Louis... You may be my brother, but you are not my master. Now move away from the door. Damn you! Swithin! I must talk to you. I will be down straight. Where's your brother? Finishing dinner. He is in the most boorish mood. Come quick, my love. must see you in private. The time has come for us to be open about our marriage. What? Why? My meeting with the bishop. Did he not offer any assistance? Quite the opposite. The man poured scorn on me for something that I am completely innocent of. Our relations. But how did he... Shoot your brother. I must speak to you later. Come to the con. Good evening, Lady Constantine. Mr. Glanville. Louis. Mr. St. Cleve was passing through the garden on his way to the column. Was he? Uh, many thanks for the tour of your observatory. I was most entertained. <laughs> the pleasure was all mine. I look forward to hearing of any discoveries you might make. <laughs> well, I may be closer than I previously imagined. The Astronomer Royal has been impressed by some of my papers and invited me to view the observatory in Greenwich. Oh, oh. <laughs> when do you go? The end of the week. I wish you luck, sir. Now, if you... Don't mind, I'll continue my walk. It's too beautiful a night to idle away inside. Do you think he suspects? My brother suspects everything. We must set on a course of action. But not now. My brother keeps half an eye on our affairs. Wait for my signal. I will come to the cabin at the earliest opportunity. <sighs> I hope the evening air was to your liking. Most pleasant. And I hope you are in a better mood than you were at dinner. Indeed. I didn't know you allowed your lawn to be a public thoroughfare for the parish. I'm not exclusive, especially since I became so poor. So you let everyone pass that way? Or only that illustrious and handsome youth? I have no strict rule. Mr. St. Cleve is an acquaintance. He can come and go as he chooses. You should be aware that your acquaintance. He's also a sinner of the highest order. How so? Oof, I hear he sows his wild oats as well as any other young man. Please stop hinting, Louis, and tell me to what you allude. Oh, it's quite simple, really. The bishop, talking him and I, visited the young man's observatory yesterday. Today, I heard the bishop tell the young man in no uncertain terms that the ordinance of the confirmation had been profaned. Why, sir? Because the bishop perceived the presence of a young woman 
in his cabin. Can you believe it? Well, if only I'd been the one to see her. I wouldn't have left the cabin without revealing it all and sundry. So, this morning, he read him an excommunicating lecture of such venom. <laughs> I warrant the young man won't forget it in his lifetime. Oh, he should have been there. You should really feel more embarrassed about eavesdropping on a private conversation. Nonsense. Not only that, but I've remembered where I first set eyes upon the young man. At Westbury Station, just prior to my arrival, he was there with a woman whom I accidentally caught with my whip. Another of his lady friends, I suppose. Well, at the time, I took her for his wife. Oh, what a scoundrel that man is. Really, Louis? You've let your imagination run away with you this time. Swithin St. Cleeve is nothing of the sort. My goodness, woman. What is it you're looking for? You've almost turned the room upside down. There's nothing of consequence, just a bracelet of which I'm particularly fond. A bracelet? I cannot think where I've mislaid it. A coral bracelet? Yes. Have you seen it? No, I'm afraid I have not. I cannot think how careless I've been to mislay it. It was. Careless indeed. It is no worry. The bishop does not need to know anything more than he does. I don't want anyone, least of all that man, thinking he is my moral superior. And your brother, too. Knowing my business for what appears to be pure sport, it, it is intolerable. What other option do we have? My love, let us declare our marriage. Let us write and tell the bishop about the misunderstanding under which he labours. I cannot. Even as your wife, the position is too undignified. I cannot admit that I hid in a cupboard to escape detection. It is beneath me. It would make me ridiculous throughout the county. You would rather I be thought of as a degenerate than agree to let our marriage be known. Your success is closer than ever, Swithin. You have said so yourself. This trip to the Royal Observatory may be the moment you are recognised for the genius you are. Please, let us not stray from our original plan. But when I think on it, I, I, I become ever more irritated by the pompous old fool reprimanding me in such a way. How dare he? I still don't understand how he perceived it to be a woman and not a man that hid in here. Ah, oh, he, um, he found a bracelet close by. A bracelet? My coral bracelet? But where is it? Oh, I must have left it. I must have left it in the churchyard. I rushed away in somewhat of a hurry. Oh, my dear, dear Swithin. You have compromised me by your forgetfulness. I have claimed the bracelet as my own in front of my brother. What if he now suspects that I was the woman here? You are up early. Is anything worrying you? There is a letter just arrived for you. It carries the bishop's seal. A thank you letter, I presume? A proposal of marriage is more likely. If it is so, then I am afraid he will receive an answer flat. You will do no such thing. Do you think I don't know of your infatuation with that young scientific Adonis? Believe me, Viviette, you're making a fool of yourself. You are losing touch with reality. Am I? And was it not this coral bracelet of yours that the bishop found in St. Cleve's cabin. Do you see? You blush again. Have you no shame? I do not have to put up with this from you. Tell me straight. Do you love him? Would it be such a wonder if I did? Come, tell me straight. I do. Yes, I do. You're making a fool of yourself, Viviette. You're twice his age. See sense. And if the bishop has offered you the hand of marriage, say yes. I cannot and I will not. Then conduct your affairs in your own way. I know you to be leading a life that will not bear the scrutiny of investigation, and I'll be hanged if I stay in your presence a moment longer. Joshua, your father's letter was just as I had imagined, courteous and polite. But my marriage to Swithin plainly made an acceptance an impossibility. I had to refuse immediately. But then how was I to sign myself? I could not in all faith write Viviette St. Cleve, but to do anything else would involve deception of the highest order. Yes, ma'am? What time does the train depart for London? It leaves in about half an hour. Then let us make haste. Oh, 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 oh. The train to London goes from the other platform. Wait here. I'll only be a few minutes. 
Lady Constantine. I need a word with you regarding the observatory at Prince Hill's Fifth. Uh, yes, Lady Constantine. My dear Viviette, this is very forward of you. Surely it risks everything. This morning I received this in the post. I will only be gone a few days. It couldn't wait. Good gracious. A proposal. The impertinent old man. What have you done about it? What can I do? I fear I must follow the course of action you suggested and confide our situation to him. I tell you something, Viviette. I am not disposed to tell this man anything at all. If he's the type of man to go falling in love and making proposals of marriage and then feels it appropriate to lecture me on propriety... Swallow your pride. You are still nursing the wound of being berated. You should have heard what he said. Enough. You first proposed making a confidant of him. I did. Very well. Let us tell him. But no one else. We must also tell Louis. He has discerned something of our relationship and is now thinking the worst of me. I cannot bear to live with him suffering that delusion. Very well. You must go. All will be well by the time you return. I did write a letter confiding in the bishop and declining his proposal. I even signed it under my married name. It is the only time I have ever written that name. Viviette St. Cleve. It sounds so strange to the ear, doesn't it, my boy? But before that letter could be sent, fate once again had the final say. There is a gentleman to see you, my lady. A gentleman? A clerk from Mr. Cecil's office. A solicitor at this hour? He claims it to be a somewhat urgent matter. Show him in, then. Thank you. Oh, Lady Constantine, how wonderful that we should finally meet. I hope you will forgive this intrusion. Please sit down. Thank you. I am told you have urgent business, Mr... Wishkin, my lady. Mr. Wishkin, at your humble service. Indeed, uh, uh, I was wondering, ma'am... Whether you have glanced at today's paper by any chance? No, I really do. Uh, really? Of course. However, uh, th that is... Uh, how should I put it? Uh, unfortunate. Mr. Wishkin, whatever business you have, I pray conduct it. Oh, of course, of course. There appears to be some confusion as to your husband's death. He died of malarious fever. That appears to be a misunderstanding. We now have word from a reliable source in Africa that he was not killed by the mosquito, but um, uh, by his own hand. So Blunt took his own life? Yes, indeed. Uh, not only that, in addition, it appears he was married at the time of his death. And... Not only to you, as it were. Uh, that's what this report says. Uh, Sir Blount married a native princess according to the rights of the tribe and was living very happily with her until his death in late December. But he died on October the 24th. Unfortunately not, Lady Constantine. According to this correspondent who claims to have it on the highest authority, as high as one gets in Africa... He took his own life in late December. December? Yes. Of that, I'm afraid, there is no doubt. My dear Swithin, what I have to write to you now is so sad and so humiliating that I can hardly write it. But I must. Sir Blunt did not die until some time after we supposed, and as such, I am not legally your I heard wife. the news myself, which is on the lips of everyone in this city. There is only one course of action that seems fitting. Let us be married in as open a manner as possible and confess to anybody that there has already been the solemnization of marriage between us. I feel so frightened and ashamed that I can scarcely arrange my thoughts. The newspaper sent with this will explain all. I will leave here early and will return by Sunday morning. Slip out during the service and come to the tower. I will meet you there. I'm waiting for Mr. St. Cleve. I was told by his grandmother that he may be here. I believe he has yet to return from London. Could I take a name? I am assured that he will return in the next hour. I am Lady Constantine. I know who you are. Uh, have we met before? We have not. 
Could I ask Mr St Cleve to find you in the village? It is of no matter. Your presence here is sufficient answer to my question. I don't understand, sir. Do you know Mr St Cleve? I am the solicitor acting on behalf of his late great-uncle, Dr Jocelyn St Cleve. Mr St Cleve has spoken of him, but how does my presence have any bearing on that unfortunate business? He has not told you. (laughs) Then the man in question is more of a boy than I care to imagine. You speak harshly, sir, about someone of whom you know very little. I know enough. And you do well to defend him, considering the damage you are doing to the boy's prospects. Damage? I've said too much already. Please inform Mr. St. Cleve that there is no need for a written reply. I demand, whoever you are, tell me how I've damaged Mr. St. Cleve's prospects. Let's be candid, Lady Constantine. You have ensnared the poor boy. Ensnared? I have observed the two of you with my own eyes. I don't know what you have seen. He's a boy with, I'm told, a future ahead of him. His great uncle has promised him an annuity to further his studies on one condition, that he was to cease relations with yourself. Cease relations? You are impoverished, madam. And you're old. I speak frankly when I say that any woman who acts so selfishly as to injure a young man's prospects in this way deserves to be told the truth, plain. And simple. I have encouraged him in his studies. They are as important to me as they are to him. <laughs> Mon folly. If you had any kindness for that man, you would stop whatever madness is occurring between you and release him to pursue his destiny. Your very refusal to see that and do so speaks none too well of yourself. I have to return. I will go. You stay and deliver my message. If you could be so good as to hand him this, it is a copy of the original document he received. I desire a reply by the end of the week, his 21st birthday, or the generous annuity of his benefactor will be void. The name is Bateman, Lady Constantine. Bateman. I remember running towards home, my face hot with embarrassment and humiliation. Each word contained in that letter cut me like a switch. Humiliated and shamed by a man I'd never met. Do not make a fool of yourself, as your father did, he exhorted with him. He referred to both my age and my poverty. He told Swithin that any woman who dotes upon a man much younger than herself has no moral fiber. It is difficult to describe my feelings of overwhelming shame. The choice seems so simple now. Come clean to the world about us. But I was foolish, Joshua, wrapped up in my position and my reputation. You must never make the same mistake that I was about to commit. Who could that be? At this hour? Mr. St. Cleve for you, ma'am. Please tell him I am unavailable. Very well. Well, I'm relieved you're seeing sense. Finally. It's as well that youth understands his true position in the world. Please. Do not talk about him in that way. Why? I'm simply following your lead. That boy deserves what he gets. I want him to go. Leave Welland. Go on his travels to wherever his 400 a year will take him. 400 a year? His great uncle left him an annuity. He should go and study the southern constellations. If that is your wish, I will represent to him the advantage of that course. It is my wish. I apologise for invading your hermitage, Mr. St. Cleve, but I've heard from my sister of your good fortune. Good fortune? You have the chance to rove the world. I have not yet made the decision to go. Not going? But 
I understood a kindly uncle has bequeathed you a sufficient income to make you the new Isaac Newton, if only you use it as he directs. Have you spoken to Lady Constantine of this? Certainly. More than that, it is her request, though I did not intend to say so, that I come to speak to you now. I need you to tell me frankly and plainly. Does she wish me to go? She does. Then I will. I received a letter this morning from the Astronomer Royal giving me permission to use the Cape Observatory. I will take him up on his offer. An excellent idea. Excellent. But if she wishes me to go, I must hear it from Lady Constantine's own lips. That is impossible. Then so is my departure. Now see, Mr. St. Clair. I will not go without her direct bidding. That is my condition. You are an impudent, headstrong young man. If my lady requests this of me, then I will go. I will wait for her here at seven tomorrow evening. If she wishes me to go, then that is her opportunity. I wandered to this place with dread. It was everything I could do to stop my brother coming with me. I made my way through the fields. The horizon to the west gleamed like a foundry of all metals, Connor and Rev. My heart pounded with the fear that I would not hold to my resolve. Aching to beg him to stay. Knowing that I had to sacrifice our love for both our sakes. My dear Viviette, I will not do it. You must. I will not go away from you. Why did you propose it? Your great uncle, despite his manner, is right. I am penniless, and though you don't see it now, I am old. You will come to despise me. I will never do that. Now we must forget this silliness has ever passed between us and name the day of our marriage. No, I will not ruin you. The day after you are five and twenty, then our marriage will be confirmed. <sighs> if you so choose. That is five years hence. I... This is my demand. Go from here, pursue your travels and return. I promise that I will keep myself here and wait for you and news of your discoveries in the hope that you will return and still see in me what you see now. No, no, no I cannot do it. I will not. Take your bequest and go. You are too young to be fettered. Do not communicate with me. It is imperative. Please. Don't make me do this. You gave me your word if I told you by my own lips. Do not follow me. I do not have the strength to push you from me a second time. Viviette, my love. Please, don't make me do this. Careful. I said, careful! Oh, where do you want it, Master St. Cleave? Over there. Oh. You're taking this on your travels as well, Master St. Cleave? I'm taking everything, Amos. Everything. I watched this very place from my bedroom window as the equatorial was dismantled. I watched him in the distance, directing the activity. A man of 21. A day that should be filled with happiness. But instead I saw the sadness in the way he stood and the way he moved. And if he could have seen me, he would have seen me standing in the same way. <coughs> you need to keep the string taut. You need to practice. All right, I shall come in a moment. Hello, hello, hello Lady Hellsdale. It is I, a uh, person talking up. Ah, ah, Lady Hellsdale, I was told I would find you here. Oh, it is many years since I took this view. And the same for me, Mr. Talkingham. Not since young Swithin left for the Cape, I imagine. And yet, since my return to Welland, I have quite taken to this place. I was sorry to hear about Bishop Helmsdale. He was an inspiration to us all in this parish. That's kind of you. 
I'm afraid I remember him only as a husband. Indeed. And will you be returning to Welland on a permanent basis? <laughs> uh, um, <laughs> Thank you. You are most kind. Nothing too serious, I hope? Nothing that the Wessex air won't heal. <laughs> oh, I, I almost forgot. Grandma Martin, Swithin St. Cleve's grandmother, sends her regards. Her grandson is making great headway in the Southern Hemisphere. His discoveries are said to be the subject of discussion at Oxford University. <laughs> I never doubted he would succeed. I hear that the young man may return, now his observations have concluded. Return? Tell Mrs. Martin that I look forward to seeing the young man again. And how happy I am for his success. Mm -hmm. I should be going. I will leave you to your writing. A letter. I am almost at the end. Didier. 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 Yes, Louis. Oh, stop staring at that tower. You've done nothing but stand in that window for almost a week now. I have done as you wished. Can you not now leave me be? Sending him on his expedition to the Southern Seas was as much your idea as it was mine. He's only going because you directly bid it. I'm going to my room. Why did you not tell me of the bishop's letter? You should have told me he has written again. It is a private business. The man has given you a second chance, yet. He's put your refusal down to the news of that rogue, blunt Constantine, rather than your feminine rashness. My answer to the bishop will be the same as the last one. You are trying my patience. All I'm trying to do is to help you. It's as if I'm trying to drag you to market. St. Cleve will be gone the day after tomorrow. Perhaps then this mood you're in will be gone once and for all. I remember coming here to the column, Joshua, after he had gone. I pushed open the door to the column and saw its bare interior, as if all the intrigues that had taken place were figments of my imagination. I feel more alive now than I have done in all my life. Lady Constantine she... shall be his queen. Good night, this with him. And then... As I stood on top of the tower, staring at a view that once we shared, I saw a boy running through the fields, a child with corn-coloured hair running through the mustard fields. And though it can't have been, I know it was you, Joshua. And suddenly I knew what I had done. Where is it? What? The note from Mr. St. Cleve telling me when the Occidental sails. What could he want with that? It is of utmost importance that I should know whether he has actually sailed or not. Where is it? I destroyed it. Why? He's gone. Leave him be. I must get to Southampton. Run after St. Cleve absurd. I must see him. I must speak to him. Have you gone mad? I will go anyway. I will start out for Southampton immediately. He has sailed. What? Read for yourself. He leaves as we speak. No. No. All is lost. I want to drown. I want to drown myself. Let me drown. If yet have you taken leave of your senses? I'm glad the Occidental has said this was the level of the attachment you felt towards that boy. That boy was my husband. What? Legally. Or was so until I discovered the date of my first husband's demise. The deceitful lovers. I knew it. It was I whose face you caught with a whip on your way to Welland. I whom you mistook for Swithin's wife. Because I was his wife. Such folly as I never imagined. And now, the worst of it. I am carrying his child. How has it come to this? Do not worry. Despite our differences, I don't intend to leave you to wallow in the shame of your predicament alone. We will find a way through this. Believe me. Mr. Glanville is here, my lady. Oh, 
You asked me to tell you when he had arrived? Bishop! But why? Tell my brother I have a headache and have retired to my room. If you do not open this door, I will break it down. The bishop waits in the library. How could you? You promised... Open this door. You said you were going to find the address. I need to speak to Swithin. Uh, Swithin, I promised to get you out of this situation and that is what I am doing. For your information, not even St. Cleve's grandmother has his address. You're doomed unless you follow this plan. The bishop has been informed by me that a second proposal in person would be the correct approach to attain your hand in marriage. I can't. I can't. He's so much older than I. Thought repels me. Think how St. Cleve felt. <sighs> My dear sister, you have no choice. Polite society will cast you out. Sir Blunt Constantine's relatives would only be too happy to turf you from this house and cast you into poverty, and I do not have the time, money, nor inclination to become your keeper. I have tried to be a virtuous woman. Why is God punishing me? Perhaps it's time to ask his forgiveness by marrying a man of the cloth. You mock me. You mock yourself. My life is over, isn't it? In many ways, it is. You say the bishop waits in the library? He does. Then I must go and see him. Please, tell him I will be there shortly. Be brave. For the sake of your child, you must be brave. You will ask Joshua why I never told your true father about you. The truth is, I did. I wrote him a letter. I wanted to release him from his obligations. I considered it best for all our reputations. I was a fool. Bishop Helmsdale, how wonderful to see you. Lady Constantine, you look... Ravishing. That is my confession. I would not do without you, Joshua. You who have grown to be so like your father. But now, as I sit, eaten away by the ravages of time, I dream of a time when life was so much simpler. When dreams were possible. I wouldn't have believed it unless I'd been told by Granny Martin that it were true. Parson talking of... You haven't changed. Oh, you have, my boy. Well, well, no longer a boy. Now, you have made great discoveries. Word spreads even to Welland. How is my grandmother? A little less sure on her feet, perhaps. She misses her favourite grandson. And surely the sight of thee will put pay to any creaking joints. And who is that? Why, you must remember Tabitha Locke. <laughs> Mr. St. Cleve? Is that your boy, Tabitha? No, sir. This is Joshua, son of Lady Constantine that was. Lady Elmsdale now. It's her boy, the bishop's son. The bishop's son. And how are you, young man? It's kind of flying weather, sir. So would you like to see it? Mama flies it from the tower. <laughs> the tower? <laughs> Rings Hill Spear, has it been so long that you've forgotten it? Oh, I could never forget those years at the tower. <laughs> As I thought. Now run, run along, boy. Tell your mother there is an old friend in town. No, no, don't. And Tabitha, you are not married? Tabitha has no time for a husband. She's been very busy in London, Mr. St. Cleves. She has had great success at the Royal Academy of <laughs> Music. <laughs> Such good news. You were always a talent, Miss Locke. Oh, Swithin, you've made the young lady blush. I was just accompanying the young Joshua to collect some brambles. Lady Elmsdale needs all the time to rest. Why? You've not heard. She's not well. Something ails her. She's a shadow of her former self. Perhaps 
the shock of her husband's death. I think you'd agree, Parson. It happened a long time before that. Anyway, Miss Lark, this young man should be on his way home. I know an elderly lady who will die happy should she see his face. <laughs> Good day to you both. <laughs> oh, I knew he'd grow up to be a credit to this village. Didn't I always say it? Yes, my son. A stranger has come to town. Miss Lark was talking to him. Stranger? It is I, Swithin. Do not look on me. Why? Viviette, it is I. Face me. Look at me. Yes. Time has been cruel, has it not? We have all changed, Viviette. You do not love me anymore. How could you? Don't say that. You have a right not to love me. You did once. Now I am an old woman, and you are still young and beautiful. How could you love me? It is charitable of you to even come here and see me. I have come all the way from the Cape. But not for me. You have come because your work is finished. Is that not right? You sent me away. You told me never to write and never to contact you. Not be angry with me. Time has been cruel enough without the burden of your anger. I'm sorry. If you ever cared for me, how can you doubt it? Go, please go. I shall be glad to know of you through your grandmother. Now I would much rather that we part. Yes, do not question me, Viviette. I have come to marry you. We cannot. It is too late. I am dying. But we can be together till then. Let us never part again till uncertain death tears us from one another. My love, my Swithin, I have been so foolish. True love comes so rarely in life, and I have squandered it for both of us. I will take care of you. Take this letter, and make sure that whatever happens, that Joshua will read it. Why? So that our son may not make the same mistake that we made. Our son. Our legacy. <gasps> Mother. Mother. Hush. Hush, my child. Mother is sleeping. I will take care of him, Viviette. I promise you. <laughs> In Two on a Tower, Lady Viviette Constantine was played by Maggie O'Neill and Swithin St. Cleve by Blake Ritson. Tabitha was played by Amy Humphreys and Louis by Richard Heap. Fellows and Amos were played by Stephen Tomlin and Parson Talkingham and Bateman were played by Conrad Nelson. Bishop Helmsdale and Cecil's Man were played by Russell Dixon and Joshua by Carter Dowland. Two on a Tower by Thomas Hardy was adapted by John Senn and produced in Manchester by Stephanie Screet. <laughs>